at Leghorn, Italy, one phase of a huge materiel redeployment program involves the salvage and reconditioning of American supplies and weapons left over after the defeat of Germany. An army estimate indicates that at least 70% of its equipment in the European and Mediterranean theaters is earmarked for use in the war against Japan. Battle-worn vehicles arriving at this collection point are stripped of motors and other usable parts. Steam cleaning motor blocks and crankshafts before reconditioning. Jeep engines are overhauled and prepared for shipment at the rate of 115 per day. Italian civilians and German PWs are employed at this center under the supervision of army technicians and mechanics. The job of rehabilitating equipment has been underway for some time. In addition to the depots in Italy, 81 repair bases are now going full blast in France, Belgium, and England. Checking and repair is not the whole job of preparing ordnance, signal corps, and other material for the Pacific Front. Differences in battle and climatic conditions require modifications and special processing. Precautions must be taken against corrosion and fungi. Delicate precision instruments must be given waterproofing treatment and packaging before moving into the humidity and tropical storms of the Far East. preparing surgical instruments for reissue. After a thorough cleaning, they're placed in a drying oven with a temperature of 250 degrees. Then the instruments are dipped in an oil solution and allowed to drain off before packing. All medical equipment that can be spared is being rushed to the Pacific. The instruments are wrapped in moisture-proof paper, which in turn is carefully sealed with a layer of wax. In the small arm shipping sections, rifles which have been completely overhauled are given final check and dipped in a cosmoline vat. Repair and distribution of materiel is coordinated with troop movements. Units going directly to the Pacific hold on to their equipment and get replacements for anything deficient. Outfits redeployed to the United States leave their weapons at various depots. Renovated equipment normally goes from the depots to a central stock pool, from which orders are filled for direct shipment to the Pacific. General Ox and other officers inspect disassembly and crating operations at the Ordnance Vehicle Park. Central clearing point for all shipments to the Pacific out of this area is the 10th Port Quartermaster in Transit Depot. Loading of Liberty ships goes on 24 hours a day. While materiel movements reach an accelerated pace, troop departures continue out of redeployment centers of the Assembly Area Command. Men of the 156th Field Artillery Battalion, 44th Division, are processed at Camp Pittsburgh, Mourmelon sub-area near Reims, France. The troops pack their own Cosmoline Colt 45 automatics. About two and one half million men are expected to pass through ETO processing centers. Floodwaters inundate the fertile Varengemeer area in Holland when the Germans blow up the dike erected to hold back the waters of the Zuidersee. The country is a patchwork of 2,500 polders, reclaimed land areas which can be easily flooded. Three villages and 400 farms are destroyed in the Varengemeer polder, five meters below sea level. The people salvage what they can from the wreckage of their homes. Although repair work on the bombed out dikes is underway, Holland's rich agricultural lands are expected to be unproductive for years as a result of the saltwater flooding. German war prisoners remove landmines from the Netherlands. In the province of North Holland, a million and a half mines planted by the Nazis are being dug up at the rate of 3,000 a day. Removing a German VB wooden box mine designed for use against tanks and other vehicles. The mine weighs 18 pounds, is about 12 inches square, and requires a pressure of approximately 200 pounds for detonation.
The mines are carried to a secluded area and then destroyed. In Norway, German prisoners of war are likewise employed to dig up mines which the Nazis planted during their long occupation of the country. Prisoners are compelled to prod and measure known minefields where mines are laid in rows four deep. A fuse and charge are used for detonations. These anti-personnel shoe mines are exploded four at a time. A Norwegian army guard checks off the mines as they're blown up. The prisoners prod the cleared areas with sticks to make sure no mines are left which might later kill Norwegians. At Esterwegen prison camp, Germany, high-ranking German officers who are known war criminals are demobilized from the German army and made civilian prisoners of war. No longer entitled to privileges awarded prisoner of war officers, they are now to be treated as ordinary criminals. The men march back to the parade ground after exchanging their Army, Navy, and Air Force uniforms for denim work clothes. Approximately 800 prisoners are transformed from officers into civilians in a 20-minute ceremony. As civilian prisoners, they'll be compelled to perform necessary prison camp labors. An improvised bit developed by an ordnance officer on Okinawa for cavitizing high explosive shells. The bit is adjusted to the same length as a VT fuse. Occasional shortage of deep cavity shells has necessitated the converting of standard shells to accommodate the VT fuse. Standard impact or time fuses require a cavity approximately two and a quarter inches deep. The VT fuse requires a cavity of approximately five inches deep. In order to use VT fuses with standard shells, the cavity has to be increased the necessary depth. An ordinary toothbrush is used to demonstrate the depth of the cavity and help clean it. Reports from several theaters indicate that cavitizing has been accomplished either by drilling or by melting and forming. The converted shells are code marked in paint before being shipped to forward artillery positions. Following the dropping of propaganda leaflets by plane, loudspeakers are used to get the civilians and soldiers still in hiding out of the cliffs at the island's southern extremity. For the first time in the Pacific War, enemy soldiers surrender in large numbers, possibly indicating increased belief in our propaganda unit's frequent assurances of good treatment. Among the troops giving themselves up are an unprecedented number of officers. Interrogation of those surrendering reveals many soldiers trying to pass themselves off as civilians. Natives who've lived underground for months are taken to camps for screening and rehabilitation. The prisoner of war stockade at Kadena containing more than 1,500 Japanese. As mopping up operations proceed on the island, Japanese prisoners continue to swell the ranks of those already interned. By 28th June, the total number of Japs captured on Okinawa totals more than 9,500. More than 3,000 of these are troops used solely for labor purposes. Prisoners are kept at the stockade for approximately six weeks and are then sent to Hawaii. Screening of the personnel reveals that the troops who fought on Okinawa are from the Japanese mainland, Korea, and Okinawa itself. For the most part, they appear healthy and well-fed. And when they discover that the surrender propaganda terms of safe treatment are carried out, they become quite cheerful.
Among the internees are a number of Okinawan civilians who took uniforms from dead Jap soldiers to protect themselves from the cold. They are slowly being separated from the troops in the process of screening. The age range of the prisoners is from 15 to 75. The extreme young and the extreme old are used in labor battalions. Japanese losses on Okinawa, including the men taken prisoner, amount to more than 111,000. At 1000 on 22nd June, a flag raising ceremony is held at 10th Army headquarters to mark the official securing of Okinawa. The 82-day campaign cost us approximately 12,000 in killed or missing and approximately 35,000 wounded. <laughs> Navy films of fleet operations during the Okinawa campaign. Elements of the fast carrier task force send aircraft aloft for strikes in support of American invasion forces. Japanese planes, including suiciders of the Kamikaze Corps. Strafing Japanese shipping and other targets. In a broadcasted statement, 10th July, Secretary of the Navy Forrestal said, for more than 18 months, the Navy's fast carrier task force has kept the Japanese air forces off balance. The Navy has sunk more than 250 major Japanese warships and hundreds of merchant vessels and destroyed thousands of planes. While the sorties continue, some enemy aircraft penetrate our defensive ring. Guns aboard the warships bring down many of the raiders. Just released by the Navy, these scenes show the aircraft carrier Saratoga hit 21st February, two days after the Iwo Jima invasion. In succeeding months, Kamikaze raiders struck repeatedly with record intensity and fury. Passing a battleship, a suicide plane is hit many times before it dives into the after section of an Essex-class carrier. Commenting on damage caused by the Japanese suicide air war, Admiral Limit said, the enemy has expended a large number of planes and personnel on missions of this nature with negligible effect on the continuing success of our operations. Some major units of the fleet have been damaged, but no battleship, fast carrier or cruiser has been sunk. Effective methods of meeting and destroying suicidal attacks have been developed and will continue to be employed to increase the toll of Japanese aircraft shot down by our aircraft and our anti-aircraft guns. Meanwhile, following the Jap attacks, carrier aircraft returned to undamaged or quickly repaired ships. One of the planes overshoots the flight deck. Another cuts over the side of the carrier and continues its flight. The majority of landings are without mishap as carrier warfare continues closer to the Japanese homeland. <laughs> 